Okay. So we've known for generations that access to credit and where we place our public in infrastructure investment has led to this uneven development in our cities. And these often race-based antagonisms have led to the formation of minority depository institutions as a response to the financial and social exclusion that's characteristic of racially segregated space. And the formation of MDIs reflects a logic of reinvestment that captures the value of socially conscious, culturally sensitive services. And this logic of reinvestment is really at the heart of the MDI mission. And the logic of reinvestment, we introduce it as a way to capture the ways that minority neighborhoods fill the gap in banking services. Ethnic groups excluded from banking pooled their money together to establish communal types of lending. And in this manner, the neighborhood actually circulated the capital needed to spur local business development. So the logic of reinvestment is actually a banking strategy, which also recognizes the neighborhood as an important unit of analysis. And the economic literature informs us that race and location can be seen as types of risk classes that present challenges to banking and the selection of clients and deciding which borrowers are actually safe. And from this view, race and location become efficient sorting mechanisms in the form of rational redlining to overcome adverse selection problems. However, these sorting mechanisms reinforce a bundle of race-based structural disadvantages that classify minorities as higher risk to banks. And a number of studies during the 80s and 90s point out how structural dis discrimination actually becomes embedded into spatial disparities. Vermeer on a number of occasions has warned us how NDIs would be constrained in supporting economic productivity in their service areas. Minsky also understood this problem and presented a system of community development banks to support the MDI mission, a solution which also refocused our attention on the neighborhood as a key unit of analysis. And we are interested in the effectiveness of how these MDIs that are operating today, we want, the, we want to look at the conditions of their service area and the state of race, race relations. And through this work, we know that the effectiveness of MDIs is really sensitive to the economic circumstances of the racial and ethnic makeups of these neighborhoods, the structure of governance, and the overall pattern of urban governance at multiple levels. And, it's, and we're interested in the evolution of financial technologies that affect the strategic op options that MDIs have for transformative practices in the neighborhoods they serve. So we use Los Angeles is our case study to work through these issues. And we want to be clear on how we use the term technologies as a bundle of actions, routines, customs, and policies or actions that support and also reorganize market operation. And it's a process of securitization would be a good example here. Technologies are used for the most part as a public good to build and support community wealth. Technologies can be viewed also as a system of provision. However, all too often we see such technologies used to support speculation and real estate expansion, as well as racial exclusion in ways that often lead to market instability. And these use, the, such use actually negatively impacts the NDI goals of community development, neighborhood stabilization, and create a differential market access that MDIs are actually enlisted to repair. So let's take a look at this historical pattern of technologies. We know beginning in the early 1900s, the real estate industry formed, formalized the use of race covenants, restricting ownership on land, and segmenting the marketplace by clearly defining who can and cannot occupy property. FHA redlining in the 1930s defined who and where access to credit can happen. FHA also required the use of race covenants on, on loans and, and the creation of Fannie Mae, a secondary mortgage market, 
was created just for the buying and selling of these loans and resulted in a national scale housing financial infrastructure that was limited specifically to whites. Tax increment financing in the 50s provided the capital for urban redevelopment programs, displacing and transferring of land, and the redevelopment of previously redlined space. And so government sponsored segregation now became the site for speculative commercial development. Race was always a factor in valuation of property up until 1976. And civil unrest in the 1960s led to the reorganization of Fannie Mae and FHA, plus the addition of Freddie Mac. And this further segmented our housing finance system. However, FHA programs continued to redline in the 1970s, resulting in the economic baseline we see in the map here, uh, shown on the right. And this map now represents the social, spatial, and economic baseline we actually see today. And as a solution, the FHA 235 programs in the 70s targeted low-income borrowers, but instead these programs produced massive amount of foreclosures similar to the subprime crisis in our cities across the United States. FHA moved to direct underwriting where lenders can approve their own loans on behalf of FHA. However, prior to reforms of this program, this direct underwriting had the adverse effect of concentrating loan denials in redline space. And during the 1990s, securitization revamped the secondary mortgage market with one of its largest impact on neighborhoods being the over-inclusion of minorities in the predatory subprime market. So we can see how technologies are used as specific market interventions that lay out rules for market participation and has actually created a geography of red line space that we have to see now. So in the 1990s, the direct underwriting policies were supposed to bring more access to lending in minority neighborhoods. More local processing by lenders would result in efficiencies and access. But we can see in the 1990 map on the right, that clearly didn't happen. In fact, red line space even became more pronounced. And in, also during the 1990s, bank deregulation policies and tax reforms brought in, brought in uh, new rules that shifted lending from a service of consumer protection to, to a service of maximizing profit. For example, policies eliminated uh, limits on interest rates, permitted adjustable mortgages and balloon payments. Tax exempt real estate mortgage conduits were created allowing banks to take these new obli debt obligations off of their books while requiring, uh, uh, well, while actually relaxing the requirements for reserves. Although this increased the flow of capital by expanding the secondary markets for purchasing debt, it also shifted the risk of default from loan originators to Wall Street. And the impact to consumers was, of course, predation concentrated in loans previous uh, locations previously mortgage redlined. Lending shifted from neighborhood banks to brokers who incurred no risk for predatory lending practices, and it, which effectively undermined the MDI mission. The end result was the financial devastation of this MDI service area. And we can see this when we look at the FHA loss of market share. The subprime market streamlined loan approval process, reduced checks and balances. Fees were used to mitigate any credit problem or any perception of risk. Second mortgages were used as down payments. Long processing delays on FHA loans, low, low, loan li low mortgage limits prevented any realtor at the time from using an FHA loan. So we can see this dip, how this market share of friendly consumer loans was lost. And so here we see this where stated income loans, those ninja loans, no income, no asset, no uh, job verification loans were concentrated in LA County's low income zip codes in a geography that is similar to red line neighborhoods in the 70s. As the adjustable interest rates exploded, we can also see how this red line space became the site for defaulted loans, foreclosures, and displacement of households. So now let's look at the growth of MDI banks since 1994. The main point here is a huge difference in the rate of Asian MDI banks 
when compared to Black and Latino banks. The Asian banks grew almost 300% since 1994, where Black MDI branches actually declined by 67%. Along with these, along with these uh, increases in bank branches, we also see a dramatic increase in the volume of deposits in, MDI, in Asian MDIs. It's, it's almost a 60% uh, angle going straight up in the air. And so now what we have here is a cluster analysis uh, because we want to understand these, these, these non-random clusters of census tracts situated in red line areas to demonstrate how these patterns of, seg patterns of segregation are persistent over time. And so we can see how these clusters are basically mirrors of red line spaces we see as far back as the 70s. And so to the right, we place the location of MDI branches and show how most MDI branches are really not locate, located in the areas of persistent segregation. So it's, it, it, it will be very, very difficult for MDIs to meet their mission when they are no longer located in the areas where they're needed the most. And so we can actually see the effects of new technologies taking place in Los Angeles. Here we capture the results of immigration policy being used to raise development capital. We see the location of EB-5 immigration funded pro projects in Los Angeles with clusters situated near Asian MDI branches, thus providing some indication of why these branches have, have grown so fast. We can also see the negative effects of this new financial technology as Latino neighborhoods are now in the line of commercial development that would lead to gentrification and displacement. And you can see those by the yellow circles, uh, which indicate high concentrations of Latino residents. And also, we can also see how these financial talk technologies have helped to shape the geography where COVID-19 cases are now concentrated. The geography of COVID cases is identical to red line space. COVID concentration also marks the location for lost economic productivity with the lack of MDIs contributing to the unavailability, unavailability of COVID emergency funds for these areas. Access to COVID dollars is affected by banking relationships. And during the initial funding rounds, most of these funds were gone within hours of the call for applications. And so these government funding programs actually mirror patterns of divestment again. And so now we see new technologies showing up in the form of tax reform and tax relief at the heart. And this is at the heart of these new technologies where securitization provides tax shelters for mortgage-backed securities and opportunity zones provides tax shelters for capital gains and even renewable energy finance now is built around tax shelters uh, and, and tax write-offs for, for funding. And using these tax relief strategies as a proxy for comprehensive urban planning will in no way further the MDI community development mission because they will not be involved in this. Financial technologies will fund gentrification and result in displacement and reinforce historical patterns of racial and economic segregation and again, commercial real estate speculation. This impedes the neighborhood scale economic productivity that we are trying to convey through the logic of reinvestment. It impedes the MDI mission of furthering economic productivity in the hardest hit neighborhoods in our cities. And ultimately, this technology will result in capital extraction from our most disadvantaged neighborhoods where banking is the weak, is, is weakest. So we need to recognize that an intricate public, private, political, and economic infrastructure was used to produce a century of racial harm. And now neighborhood scale economic planning is essential to create the solutions that need to be equal or greater than a cumulative harm caused. That cumulative trauma that happened over a decade, decades and decades of time. 
And so we're really looking at the need for a dedicated financial infrastructure that specifically designates and, des and is designed for re revitalizing neighborhoods that are most in need. The thing is, is that we really have that technology already in place. It already exists, but it needs to be repurposed so that it can, it, so that it can promote the logic of reinvestment without continued predation of these neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, so there's one uh, question from the audience that I wanted to um, summarize and uh, give you a chance to answer. So um, regarding MDIs, if, if an MDI is um, benefiting a particular um, group, um, would it be at the cost of uh, they are discriminating other other minority groups. So no. MDI, okay. No, we don't see it as that. What mm -hmm. we see it as each MDI group has its own population that is distinct and functions in various ways that are different. If you see the Latino community in Los Angeles, their revenues come from remittances and processing remittances that actually leave the banks to, to the uh, home country of the immigrants. So that money does not stick around. If you look at the Asian populations and the monies that are coming from EB-5 programs, you'll see these monies are actually intended on investing in neighborhoods for commercial real estate development. So their, their, their functions are a bit differently. In the black communities, when the deposits are made, these people are pulling them out almost instantly. So the, the money is not reinvested in community development. So it's not one against the other, it's just each group is functioning different at the, at the local level. And I, if I can add uh, uh, to this, that uh, our third co-author, Melody Chung, who I think can't be with us at the minute, she's got childcare, uh, she, she did, uh, she, she was embedded uh, for uh, most of a year at the biggest uh, African-American owned bank west of the Mississippi. And basically, you know, their, their, their capacity to serve their community was compromised by the fact that they were operating in neighborhoods in which there was a lot of predation going on. So they had to be really careful. The available instruments like the SBA loans were really bulky and hard to access. So there were, you know, they were really constrained. What we found in some of the econometric results that we had in other papers uh, shows that in areas where there was growth and where some of the Asian American banks were locating, uh, the, the mainstream banks would pick up and, and kind of follow on once the areas had been opened up, places like San Gabriel. Uh, but this was not the case in the, some of the areas up that were primarily uh, occupied by uh, uh, Latino and African American residents. Um, is there a sense in which um, a function of banking is to kind of match savers with borrowers. But if you try to um, make the groups um, narrower in which they're serving, then the function of matching borrowers and savers might not work as well if you like chop up the population into smaller groups. Um, so is there a sense in which MDIs are beneficial but not the first best and then we could do better um, by? Yeah, if, if I can pick up, yeah, the answer is yes. You know, one of the things um, we, um, I, I was, uh, I guess, the principal author of that 1991 LA study. And in, even back then and on into the next decades, uh, what we saw was a pattern in which some of the mainstream banks were closing branches in the, uh, if you will, inner core areas. And so the idea of matching on a neighborhood basis was, was uh, uh, difficult uh, because essentially you could no longer necessarily bank where you lived. And furthermore, some of the interviews we did as part of the 91 study uh, showed that uh, some, the, the loan officers there uh, understood their neighborhoods, but actually in that time period, there was a conversion towards some of those more automated financial technologies. And the loan officers um, in the branches that were still open, uh, Wells Fargo and so on, were telling us that they couldn't make the, you know, they, they, they had lost the ability to make those, those loans. Now, the MDIs retained that ability. That was part of that personal touch. 
uh, but again, the neighborhoods were shifting. So you're you're right that that problem of matching savings and investment is is part of the puzzle to be resolved, and you know as we go forward. Okay, great. Uh, and then two more questions. So one first is uh, how does MDI certification as CD CDFI help? Uh, I'm not familiar with the acronym CDFI. Yeah, that's uh, you. You would know. Actually, I, I that was uh, uh, we, we mentioned uh, Minsky's advocacy of a system of community development banking, which actually was also advocated mm -hmm. by Calamiris and some co-authors a couple of years later. Uh, Minsky did that at the levy in the context of a suggestion to the Clinton administration about how the community development financial institutions act could be organized in order to back, provide a kind of uh, central banking and, and, and uh, loan officer instructional uh, support for banks operating in underserved areas. Uh, that suggestion was not accepted as the Clinton administration implemented the CDFI program. And instead it was viewed as a, the CDFI, uh, it, it had multiple phases, but essentially much of the money went to uh, the, some of the mainstream banks subsidiary operations rather than you know, feeding back into the community. So the CDFI program was complicated. I, I have a paper that I, I was published several years ago in the Review of Black Political Economy that reviews the situation and it's, it was an opportunity wasted in a way. And uh, another question is, how can local governments play a more significant role in the development of OZs? What was that last word? Development of what? Uh, this question also used an acronym, OZs. Uh, oh, opportunity zones. Op opportunity zones, yeah, I think so. Okay. And so, uh, one of the issues that we try to uh, tease out here is, the, is, the, is a missing level of governance. And that is happening at the neighborhood scale. There is really no representation at the neighborhood scale. And that's the essential point where all the planning has to take place. And so planning, urban development planning is basically left to the, you know, the local nonprofits who have no bandwidth to do any of this type of work. Uh, so they cannot promote projects that can qualify for this opportunity zone financing. Conversely, the opportunity zone financing because of the tax credits and the tax, uh, and not the tax credits, but the tax relief that it provides to uh, uh, investors basically becomes a way of moving ownership away from these neighborhoods and it actually pulls capital from these neighborhoods. So uh, these are not exactly the most friendly loans for developers and neighborhoods, I mean, for, for neighborhoods as the the ownership of these properties that are consumed by uh, these opportunities of financing actually leaves the hands of neighborhoods. So it, it raises the question of whether, for example, are you sort of denying access to planning for people who are vulnerable uh, without the backing of you know, financial instruments that they can use to plan and replan their neighborhood, sort of leaving them there until basically redevelopment makes that area ripe for gentrification. I should note that I, I've been living in, in, in England, teaching at, at Leeds for a while, and uh, the devolution agenda there has exactly the same problems. Uh, the, the localities don't have the tools or the fiscal capacity to plan their own futures, even because it's a highly centralized state. Same kind of problem, um, only in the case of the United States context, we're looking at the, you know, it's a, it's a racialized problem as uh, uh, the Professor Jenkins might have put it earlier. And the, and the MDIs are not really engaged in the opportunity zone finance. So we're not seeing the, they basically do not have these connections to corporate level capital and foreign capital. Uh, because they're centralized in these, these neighborhoods. They're, they're supposed to meet the needs of the neighborhoods. And so without that type of access to capital, the pl any plan that's generated from the neighborhood moves forward through external sources of funding rather than local. Another question is, uh, do you see our findings as consistent with the broad conclusions in the prof uh, work of Professor uh, Baradaran on Black banking? 
which professor? I'm sorry. Uh, Rajaran. Oh, uh, uh, yes, uh, Mar Mar uh, Marissa. Uh, broadly speaking, um, you know, there's there's been a debate over over years, and uh, we we cited the work of Andrew Brimmer, and uh, I would say that uh, Professor Badran's, um work is in that tradition. And uh, there's, you know, there's other contributions over time by, by many. And in, in a sense, the, the, the worry that uh, Professor uh, Dr. Brimmer always had was that we, you know, there was questions of efficiency, scale, but also the ability of uh, minority de depository institutions to, uh, to really serve the needs of their community, given the, uh, the kind of challenges that were going on. Now, when he wrote about this back in his first article, I think on this on Black Banks was 1972, he was looking at white flight. When he was looking at, uh, he wrote another paper in 1991 and uh, I guess 92 that uh, looked at the situation in which we had just gone through the savings and loan crisis and that many of the local uh, uh, thrifts had collapsed. So, you know, at different points, there's been challenges that have affected these communities, as we've shown, uh, building on uh, uh, what's been an evolving uh, map of financial technologies and land development uses that have always been had their biases, and so that's that's a legacy that, as we as we noted, has evolved, um, but as uh, as uh, Dr. Bostic pointed out, uh, still remains a fundamental challenge. Very good. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, Marcus, should we keep going uh, or do you want us to stop at this point? Uh, if you have some uh, comments to make uh, for two or three minutes, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, we are already beyond our time limit a little bit. But the panel starts at three. So if there are some urgent questions, you can, you can throw it in now. We can stretch it a little bit. Um, actually, what I did prepare some slides. I wanted to give the audience the first chance to ask questions, but I had one for the yeah, let's, authors. Uh, but, let's do that. Let's have another five to 10 minutes yeah. to throw your, slides, throw your slides. Um, well, I just need a couple of minutes to just ask a question, um, but let me share my slides first. Uh, can you see this one? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I've been very interested in on this topic and I read the paper with a lot of interest. Um, and I have um, we've been doing related work, but it's not really um, ready for circulation yet. But what we're doing is we're taking the IRS data mm. and trying to tabulate by zip code um, who has bank accounts. Uh, stocks and mutual funds and retirement accounts. So it's kind of like a big data approach similar to the papers you've seen today. And we're looking at the entire US population age 55 to 64 in 2018. And one thing we we're finding is that um, people in the lowest income uh, quintile, zero to 20th percentile, uh, that's where there's a lot of spatial inequality in, in financial participation, but at the top, uh, you don't see any spatial inequality. So it's mostly about at the bottom, the income distribution where you live matters. And then um, I created some figures for LA County, which is your case study. And the way to read this figures on the Y axis is participation in bank accounts. So whether or not you have a bank account, so the share of the population that are in the lowest income quintile that have bank accounts. And on the X axis is share the, uh, the zip code that's Hispanic or Latino. And you kind of see like a kind of a clear relation that um, in zip codes with more uh, Latino or, or Hispanic presence, uh, you have a lower share uh, in bank uh, that have bank accounts. And this is kind of consistent. Um, it's even more striking if you look at stocks and mutual funds, yeah. you see this negative relation. And then, uh, and then for retirement accounts as well. Yeah. But the question I had was, I would have thought that kind of based on my reading of your research, um, banking matters because in banking relations, uh, the location matters a lot. So whether you're close to a branch, um, mm -hmm. 
makes it more likely that you can like have a bank account and get a mortgage. But things like retirement accounts, mutual funds and in, in, in stocks, I would have thought that uh, location would matter less. But th these gradients are, if anything, even more extreme for uh, stocks, mutual funds, and so on. And then the other thing that I notice is, you can kind of see it in these figures, um, the spatial inequality is not just correlated with race, but even conditioning on income and racial composition. There are some zip codes that do really well and others that don't do well. Um, so these things kind of suggest that um, the racial correlations are, are striking, but there's a lot more that's going on um, and we don't fully understand. Uh, and I wanted to get a sense of how you would interpret these data. It, it actually, um, you know, my, my first reaction, Professor Yogo, would be that um, earlier in the conference, uh, I think it was mentioned that uh, wealth as well as income, uh, I think that was the first paper. And uh, the first thing would be that uh, we saw a, a, not only is there a huge wealth divide between, you know, by, by race and ethnicity, um, but the subprime crisis had a, a powerful effect in terms of, uh, you know, uh, like reducing the relative gains in wealth that had a lot to do, as, as uh, Dr. Bostic was mentioning, uh, with the, uh, the, the rise in home ownership, which was linked to the predatory lending and so on, and which then disappeared as we go into the foreclosure period. Um, and so, you know, part of that is the, the difference here is that these are accounts that would be available for people with the, like the retirement accounts with consistent access to formal sector jobs. Um, and that would be part of that kind of double vulnerability, labor market, credit market, um, that, that would be the, the situation of uh, minorities in, in the US across the board, certainly in LA County. Uh, in terms of the Latino numbers in bank accounts, um, of course, there's, there's interesting because we're looking at a population that in some cases is um, first generation and, and so on. Um, and uh, so that there's a variety of means, uh, some informal in accomplishing financing. Um, and, and what we see there is, you know, again, a situation where in part it's because of the location of where the banks are or the, and, and I actually that, I, I did a paper in 1999 in the AER papers and proceedings where we, we looked across San Gabriel Valley, uh, which as, as Jesus was showing, um, the, uh, the, those who know LA just to the, to the uh, I guess, east of the city proper, um, there's it's kind of a barbell. There was an Asian ethnoburb and then a Latino lower income area and then an Asian ethnoburb as you go out uh, toward Riverside. And essentially what you saw was concentrations of formal bank branches, both Asian e ethno banks and uh, if you will, mainstream banks uh, in the two barbells that were heavily Asian uh, uh, Pacific Islander uh, populated. But then in the middle where, you know, Pico Rivera, places like that, uh, it was mostly uh, in uh, uh, check cashers and, and pawn shops and so on. So you know, there was this kind of informal structure that had followed uh, the, where the Latino population was. And so the access was a problem. And uh, now, as, as Jesus pointed out, these redevelopment initiatives will be changing this landscape, but it makes you wonder, you know, if Pico Rivera goes upscale, will the people who've been able to afford and to have their, you know, modest homes and lifestyles there, uh, will they be able to stay there? And in, in particular, will their sons and daughters be able to reinvest there as well? Thank you. Um, hey, I think we're kind of out of time, right, Marcus? Yes, we should come to a close yeah. pretty soon, if, uh, except if he says. Yeah. If, I, if I could just comment, make one comment. Uh, the project you're doing is really fantastic in the sense that um, the paper we, we put together um, builds around what we know and don't know about banks. Like for example, we don't have geocoded information on where they make the loans. We do have geocoded information on where the bank deposits are and where the bank branches are, um, you know, thanks to the FDIC. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's things that we know and things we don't. 
And so a complete picture is really, really hard to assemble. So it would be good to maybe even share uh, what we can find out by taking advantage of big, maybe some of the big data possibilities to put together, you know, what, I mean, Dr. Bostic laid down the challenge. You know, we have legacies of, of history and institutional differentiation to overcome here. And uh, basically to do that, the more intelligence we can bring to bear on where the problems are, the, the better we can understand what has to be done, the kind of efforts that say Jesus is making in uh, intercourse Sacramento could use that kind of refined data. Um, and that certainly in LA and, and really all the other urban areas through the, through the country, especially as we've seen, uh, given the fact that, that COVID is evidently having a higher impact in areas, and this was pointed out by Dr. Cook, I think as well, uh, in areas that are already impacted by problems of access to good jobs and then to finance. So let's, uh, let's move the debate into your tribe where we can have an informal debate uh, within the groups and have another, not be too far behind the schedule. And we meet again here on Zoom at three o'clock for the final panel uh, with Mike McKee, who will moderate the panel. So I see you on your tribe and for the breakout rooms and um, informal discussion about the paper. And uh, I see you back here on Zoom this main platform uh, at three o'clock. Thanks again, Moto, for the great discussion and Jesus for the great presentation and for Gary to jump in as well. And for Thank all you. the questions. Thank you.